було написано в короткій малій поясненні про цей фільм, якщо ви мали нагоду її. Um, 
karakterčuje ukrajinsku mladu. Takže karakterčuje dáni to je drama, i tam hovoří o ukrajinské kampani. Tak tam čuje ukrajinsku mladu i o stání ukrajiny. Ale co je tím hovoří Jackman o stání ukrajiny? Is there anyone here who doesn't understand Ukrainian? A long time ago, in the spell of the sky, we looked up. One by one, 
Each color is protected from the next. When the wax melts, the colors beneath reappear. The craft lies in control of the wax, leading it into countless designs, which survived the centuries. Copper funnel tool, a kist cap, guides the wax. The kistka is heated and reheated many times to keep the wax flowing. The egg is raw. The inside dries to dust in time, while the shell may remain for generations. The name Pisanka comes from the Ukrainian word Pisate, to write. The design is written on the egg. Charred by the candle flame, clear beeswax becomes dark as ink. Straight lines come from endless practice, and mistakes made in wax cannot be changed. Each wedge of the shell holds the point of a star. Lightest dye comes first. Chemical colors have replaced the ancient dyes of boiled berries, bark, sunflower shells. After each dye, the egg is dried with great care. Little by little, the yellow pattern is sealed in wax. For small touches of color, the dye is dabbed on by hand. With the next dye, the circle will wash away while the green dots remain. Only the naked shell keeps changing. The white, the yellow, and the green are hidden from the orange. <coughs> Star Rosette is a favorite design, a sun sign with endless variations. To ensure the yearly return of the god, his image was captured on the egg in springtime. Ukrainian folk art is rich in red color of joy. Though each village might make the same design in different forms and colors, bright eggs were exchanged among the young, dark among the old. With a wide-pointed kistka, 
The wax flows fast and cools quickly. It is hard to keep the kiska hot. Final design will stand out against a black background. As the dark wax melts, of animal fat to polish and preserve the design. Each hand makes the old motifs in its own way. All figures spring from three ancient forms. Star rosettes were the endless spreading rays of the sun. Triquetra stood for divinity, the magic three of birth, life, and death. The swastika, a four-spoke solar wheel, was the old Sanskrit symbol for good luck. Each sign could be drawn in three shapes, geometric, animal, and floral. The figures grew and flourished. They were symbols rather than pictures. A tree was the tree of life. A line with no beginning and no end meant eternity. Birds with their happy songs were heralds of spring. All were signs of life, a bounty brought by the sun. To a people whose lives were tied to field and forest, springtime promised riches. Wealth was a ram or a deer. Christianity spread across Ukraine, the old meanings changed. Grapes, once a sign of good harvest, came to stand for the growing church. The four corners of the earth became the cross. pagan rite of spring, the ancient Pesenka came to celebrate the Christian Easter. For as the sun god came back from the dark, the son of God came back from the dead.
In the dawn of creation, the soul of man is kindred of the gods. Seeking splendor as eternal as the sun in the sky. Shaping with the rare vision of the inner eye life's fleeting presence. Shaped and hallowed in bronze, triumphantly supreme for all eternity. the character. 
when you do a sculptural portrait, you have to bring out the individual character so strongly that when you see the head later, it is almost if you are meeting the living person. Leo Mole is known for his highly sensitive and personal interpretations. His present task is a new commission, a head in bronze of Mykola Lysenko, the Ukrainian composer and founder of the Conservatory of Kiev. Lysenko is remembered for his compositions and arrangements deeply rooted in Ukrainian folk music. several sections and notched to keep them aligned. In my younger days, all my teachers were practicing sculptors. I was fortunate in being able to observe and absorb what has really involved. 
The plaster cast is disassembled. The rubber mold peels off like a glove and shows a reversed impression of the plasticine head. From this point on, the original model is no longer needed. The plaster cast is reassembled and will provide a firm support for the flexible rubber mold. Hot melted wax fills every crevice of the rubber mask, which is the reverse or negative impression of the original head. When the wax cools, it will become the positive or exact duplicate of the original plasticine model. In doing the work of the craftsman, Leo Mole controls every detail of the work at hand. He builds up wax to the thickness he intends the bronze to become, for the thickness of the wax will be the thickness of the bronze. In education today, I feel that the artist is not really being fully prepared for his future work. Too often, an attempt is made to teach the students how to create. And there is really no recipe how to create. Instead, it is possible to teach only the craft. The wax model is held against the rubber mold, which in turn is supported by the plaster. To hold the wax in place from the inside, the hollow must be filled with a substance that can withstand tremendous heat. That substance is a mixture of plaster of Paris and crushed red clay brick and will form the core. Often, because the student is totally unprepared in school for real world to cope with the many problems a practicing artist encounters, is only too eager to accept a teaching position somewhere. Instead of being a freelancer, creative artist, and in doing so, he almost signs his death sentence. When the teacher is just an immediate graduate from school, he becomes so scholastic, so detached from life, that teaching becomes almost a new profession which has nothing to do with the actual creative forces. I think when the student graduates, he should try to do his own work. Let him support himself in whatever way he can. He really needs to experience something of life first, or else his work will be too mechanical. Of course, it will be a struggle, but I believe in struggling. I think it is important to an artist. When he stops struggling, when the whole thing becomes just routine and comfortable, he gradually loses his enthusiasm for his work. No, graduating from university is not the end. It is only the beginning. The head in wax, supported on the inside by the core, is an exact replica of the head in plasticine. When more of the same core mixture is applied to the outside of the head, enveloping the wax, and the work is fired, the wax will melt away. It will be lost, as the name of the lost wax process indicates, and its place will be taken by liquid bronze. complex system of wax rods are attached to the model. These, when melted, will become canals for the flow of molten bronze, 
and vents for the air that will be forced out. Nails will keep the inner core from shifting when the wax is melted away. Time becomes meaningless when one is absorbed in work. Day passes into night and night into day until at long last the work is ready for the foundry. head is completely encased. Only the top of the funnel is exposed. It will become the opening for the molten bronze. The mold is ready for firing and joins other works awaiting their turn. A temporary oven or kiln is built around them using bricks and wet sand for mortar. The kiln heats for three days, then cools for two days more. The wax is gone. The forms are thoroughly dry and ready for casting. The bronze is ready for pouring at 1200 degrees centigrade. In my foundry, I built all the equipment myself because buying a modern temperature control furnaces would be very expensive. And so I came to a very simple, almost ancient method of melting bronze. As a result, it is both inexpensive and practical. It might take a little longer to melt a couple of hundred pounds of bronze but I'm not in a particular hurry and I want my work to be perfect. In a few hours the bronze is set and the mold is broken away but the job is not yet over. The plaster must be removed inside and out. The canals now converted into solid metal must be cut away the nails must be removed and the holes plugged. The surface must be treated with acid. And in the end, the head of bronze, an exact replica that has retained all the subtleties of the original work of art. Art is, I think, really a reflection of the times. Art is affected by everything that is going on in the community or in the country. But there should also be a continuity with the past. I'm trying to find that which is common to all good art in the past. Driven by a magnificent force that compels him to create, a force intangible but ever-present, as passionate and daring as life itself, the artist gives visible expression to the world he perceives, and in his creation he proffers his claim to immortality.
We'll get it perfect for the concert. Practice and more practice, Lesia. I'm counting on you. Yes, Miss Jameson. Let me sit down. Well, Lesia, you thought the people with the Josh go. No, you will miss you. Who is that? Who is speaking Ukrainian? You know we do not allow Ukrainian in this classroom. Yeah, you bohongs. No Ukrainian here. Enough out of you, young men. I will not tolerate that kind of language either. A back to work, all of you. Children of the Empire, you are brothers all. Children of the Empire, that's a beautiful. Lesia? Sarah, what are you doing here? I've got to talk to you. I've got a good idea. Teach me to dance. Ukrainian dancing. But I've got work to do. We could do it for the concert, but we don't have much time to practice. Well, let's start now. I can't. I have to go to the kitchen to clean up. among us. 
Nuts my youths and needs. Kajutsum is lodi. Darling, during the last war, did we not put these aliens in detention camps? Now they walk free again, babbling their heathen tongues, stinking of garlic. Huh? She must smell them all. She just make one. Idai, idai. It's looking up. Signed, her neighbor. And last one. You want me to play our Ukrainian music with these people? To be laughed at? No. People have no heart. Didn't I warn you? But it wasn't their fault. I'm sorry. I will not speak Ukrainian in this school. Two hundred times. Yeah. 
less clear. Are you ready now? Sarah isn't wearing her costume. Summer is nice. 
me down two, three. I remember. Up two, three, down two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two. people wouldn't even call it a town. It's not on the map. There's a community hall, a church, a grocery store. <coughs> not much to keep the young people from drifting away. They were mostly farmers from Ukraine looking for the promised land. For some it was the land around here, Olha, Manitoba, 170 miles northwest of Winnipeg. They came with their families, their dreams, their futures. In the summers they worked the land, and in the terrible winters they gathered together and told the stories. Around Olha, most of the stories are about one man. He's lived on this farm almost all his life. His name is Mike Swistoon. But 
50, 60 years ago, on Saturday nights around all her mothers would hide their daughters and forbid them to have anything to do with that Swiss doom boy. He was half gypsy and danced, they said, as if he was on fire, as if he was possessed by the devil. Cymbali needs tuning, but he's the only one around who still plays the old music. Maybe now when he plays, he is in another time, another place, when the world is different. When the audiences listen, when Mike Swistoon from Olha, Manitoba, was the strongest man in the world. In 1923, the circus came to Winnipeg. Not just any circus, but the most spectacular of all time. Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey. They snaked across the continent in 50 private boxcars. 1,400 employees put up the big top for the greatest show on earth. The people came and were spellbound. They were dazzled, amazed, flabbergasted. Even in their deepest prairie sleep, they had not dreamed of such wonders. There was Jolly Holly, the world's fattest lady. There was the world's tallest man, and the smallest couple. There was the pin cushion man and Lentini, the three-legged wanderer. And there was Lionel, the lion-faced boy. There was also the world's strongest man, and that's who Mike Sustoon had come to see. Strong men were a big attraction in the 20s, and Mike was fascinated by them. In Winnipeg, the strong man went through his act but Mike wasn't impressed. He thought he could do better. He went to the top to show circus owner John Ringling what a farm boy from Holha could do. Two cars couldn't pull him apart. He bent steel bars in his teeth. He put a rope in his mouth and pulled a Model T forward with five men in it across the circus ring. Mike was a hit. He became the strongest man in the world. It was a wonderful, magical time. He rubbed shoulders with the best of them. The Rubio system. The amazing Maximo. And the greatest one of them all, the remarkable Miss Lietzel, seen here shortly before she fell to her death entertaining 16,000 people. When the circus went on to tour Regina, Saskatoon, Calgary, and Edmonton, Mike went with them. They were to go on to Vancouver and a trip around the world entertaining kings and queens, sultans and maharajas. But not for Mike. A telegram from his father said it was time to come home. They needed help with the harvest. There was work to be done, real work. The circus people couldn't believe it. He was giving up a world tour to go back to a town that wasn't even on the map. The lion driver stepped in as a temporary strongman and Mike Swiss student went back to Olha. 
He'd been the strongest man in the world for 30 days. Pretty soon one harvest led to another and the strong man was back to being a farm boy. He would spend almost all of his life on the farm. The circus would become just another story in an old man's repertoire. He was tied to the land now and the people who had gone before. His family first came here in 1898 and lived in mud and straw shelters called Buddhas. There were five here once, housing eight families. He is restored too. He was born in this one on a straw bed at the turn of the century. It was here, too, that he watched two children die from the cold. People lived and died here without ever hearing of the circus. The houses they built for God weren't mud and stink. built six of these churches. He was paid 65 cents an hour. Each job took two years. The church was the center of their world and a place where you could always get a crowd on Sunday. With a crowd around, Mike Swistoon wasn't just a church builder. He was, once again, the strongest man in the world. I saw him performing at uh, St. John, a Roman Catholic church. After the service, they had a picnic. So uh, they tied her up to the bumper, the Model T Ford, and Mike took that knot in his mouth, and he pulled the car with about, I'd say about six people in the car, and he put the brakes on, and he pulled about, I'd say about 15 feet. Fifty years later, at Mike's birthday party, the show goes on. Okay, where do I put my foot? Hey? He's 78 years old. Once, five men could stand on his stomach. But today, when I came up, to 78, I'm very weak. Two eggs, uh, and then I got out the small pant and handkerchief. Uh, Some people remember a different one. Oh, yeah, he was also a man who was fascinated by illusions and magic. When he was a boy, he had sent a whole dollar to the great city of Chicago and enrolled in the correspondence course for magicians. And that boyhood passion was given new life in 1923. The biggest entertainer of the 1920s was Harry Houdini. When he escaped from a straitjacket in front of the Winnipeg Free Press building, a strong man from Ulha was in the audience. Houdini captivated him. They exchanged letters, and soon there was a new mic. He was now Swiss Stone the Magician, master of 42 tricks and illusions professor of hypnotism and ringmaster of his own one-man circus. 
While Houdini visited the great capitals of Europe, Mike Swistoon, after each harvest, toured the community halls of Western Canada. Admission was 50 cents, and he also provided the music for the dances which followed the performance. Well, this was quite a, quite a number of years ago. Mike was still a young man, you know. He must have been about, I would say, 25 or so, where he enjoyed, I think, going from hall to hall to entertain people. And he had all kinds of tricks up his sleeve, you know, water disappearing from glasses, you know. And he was very famous for one time. Oh, yeah. These yeah. big magic tricks and big magic shows. I, 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 <laughs> 500 people used to line up to see his tricks. Now he performs occasionally for family and his few close friends. <laughs> Trick number one in the magician's handbook was the disappearing quarter. Well, then he used to hypnotize the people, you know. People used to do all kinds of silly things and they laughed at each other, you know. And they would come off the stage and they wouldn't know what they were doing. He must have hypnotized the girls. And it seemed to them that there was water running over in the house. And the water was getting higher and higher. And the girls were getting up on the chairs, and lifting up their skirts. It was getting higher and up. And the girls <coughs> lifting up their skirts and they were screaming at the top of their heads that there was this water and they were going to drown. Well, I was young and I come out on the stage and it's going to hypnotize. I didn't know nothing about it. So he says, you're going to jump like rabbits, you know. And naturally there was four or five of us on the stage and after a little while, it didn't take a very long, preaching to us, whatever it was, we sort of got you know, drowsy and so on. And he says, go in a circle like rabbits, he says. We didn't know how to go in a circle, we were just jumping like rabbits, eh? Because see, they thought he had a demon in their way to do these tricks and 
They put it in so she knew the guy who drew me to come my ass. People around here say, oh my God, the devil. How can he the devil? He doesn't even have a good pair of pants. It's a saying with our people that the devil makes you rich, but poor Mike has nothing. If the devil was running around, he was all over North America. The Great Depression had hit, and no one was to suffer more than the people on the prairies. Now, more than ever, they needed illusions and magic, needed to see that someone was still strong. Mike went on tour, but this time there was no 50 cents admission. He performed for a meal and a bed. It was a bad blow, but not as bad as what was around the corner at Waha, Alberta. <laughs> There was a community hall at Waha, and they asked me to perform. I went to the blacksmith and chose six iron bars, but I didn't know that one of them was a spring. I went on stage and I bent five bars until I came to the sixth, the one that was a spring. Nobody knew it was a spring. Two men tried to bend it, then four men, two on each side. They couldn't do it, so I asked for three men on each side. When they bent the spring, it snapped and pushed my teeth back into my head and smashed my jaw. It was a huge accident. Somehow I finished the show and they took me to Edmonton. The doctor operated immediately. And then I went home and I never bent the bars again. I wasn't a strong man anymore. The strength was gone, but the illusions could continue. The harvest was over and he was preparing a new show. But the devil was still in the air for Mike Swistoon. His father had died and on his deathbed made Mike, the eldest son, promise to stay on the land to work the farm and hand it on to the generations who would follow. To keep his promise, he would have to give up the one-man show. When Mike Swistoon buried his father, 